This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel, broadcasting remotely. New London is a popular place in the summer months for state residents and tourists alike, but it's also one of Connecticut's most economically distressed cities. Today, where we live, New London Mayor Michael Passero joins us to talk about his city, including news that there's an agreement with the Connecticut Port Authority to move forward on a major redevelopment project at State Pier. The deal means New London will get more revenue as the project's host city. Now, do you live or work in New London? What questions do you have for Mayor Passero? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Now, later we'll hear from David Collins, a columnist for the Day of New London. But Mayor Michael Passero is joining us now on Zoom. Welcome to the show, Mayor. Good morning, Lucy. Thank you for having me. And also with us is John Henshaw. He's the executive director of the Connecticut Port Authority. Mr. Henshaw started in the job last fall, and he's a former official of the Maine Port Authority. John, welcome to where we live. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. And good Thank morning to you, Mayor Passero. <laughs> Now, let's start with the the news that broke uh, late Friday, uh, Governor Lamont announcing the signing of an agreement between New London and the companies working with the Port Authority to rebuild State Pier. The agreement clears one hurdle towards a projected $157 million redevelopment of State Pier in New London. Now, the facility will be used as a staging area for the construction of offshore wind turbines. Now, Mayor Passero, this announcement broke a months-long stalemate. What does your city get out of this agreement? Our goal, Lucy, all along was to um, recover the lost um, value of the property taxes. Uh, Historically, because the property has been uh, owned by the state of Connecticut, it has been tax exempt. And what that that means is a significant loss of revenue for a very valuable uh, piece of property in in our town. Um, So with the you know, with the transition from the Department of Transportation to the Connecticut Port Authority and, um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the um, the move to get a new operator in there and then the gradual move, movement to uh, transitioning this uh, facility into to service the growing offshore wind industry. Um, I believe it was an opportunity for the city to work with the state um, to correct that historic inequity that, uh, you know, the, the residents of this uh, host city um, don't uh, really get any benefit from this fantastic asset that really is is theirs. And how much money are we talking about, Mayor Passero, over this seven-year period? How much will New London get? It, you know, approximately uh, uh, guaranteed revenue. There, there are, it's, it's a, <clears throat> not a terrifically complicated agreement, but there are contingent payments, but the base revenue would be somewhere around $1.1, $1.2 million a year for seven years and most likely 10 years. Now, you fought pretty hard uh, to make sure that your city received proper uh, compensation because of that lost property tax revenue that you mentioned. I have to uh, mention this op-ed that you had in the New London Day back in January where you compared the Connecticut Port Authority to the British Empire during the American Revolution. You wrote in part, New London has been subjected to mistreatment by a new overlord, the Connecticut Port Authority, profiteering from our greatest asset, our deep water port. You also said the Port Authority was striking in its arrogance and gave no consideration for local impacts of the project. So does this agreement address all of your concerns, Mayor? No, the agreement is between the City of New London and Orsted and Eversource. Um, And uh, all of that, the relationship with the Connecticut Port Authority is far from repaired um, at any level. I mean, even with the City of New London is one element of of that uh, that, agreement. quasi-public agencies, very dysfunctional and um, and difficult uh, start. Um, so, I mean, I think that's no secret. Um, the city, the city was should have been included from the beginning. Uh, I mean, the most the most important voice that they should have been listening to from the very beginning in their plans was the city of New London. They would have benefited from the local knowledge. They, mistakes would have been made along the way. Um, but still there's resistance to that for some reason. 
promises were made that the city would have a seat on that board um, and they haven't been fulfilled. I mean, it's largely, we have to all work with the legislature to, to achieve that. Uh, and we understand that in New London, but we don't believe there's been a good faith effort to do that on behalf of New London. And New London has essentially been frozen out of any of the planning um, for this facility. There's been, there's still very com controversial elements to it. But we have a strong partnership now with um, with the par with the partnership between Orstad and Eversource. We we support their project, um, and uh, we're going to work in good faith to uh, to try to um, solve the help you know with other partners to solve these issues that the Connecticut Port Authority has as an agency. So let's hear from the Connecticut Port Authority. Again, I mentioned the Executive Director, John Henshaw, is with us on Zoom. Uh, John, how do you address uh, the mayor's concerns? Well, I think the mayor rightfully is a strong advocate for the city, and that is, is definitely his role. We want to be a good partner with the city. Um, I think that we have the opportunity to do so. I, I just want to point out that um, Mayor Passero was actually the first public official I met with uh, when I came to Connecticut uh, last August. And um, so I look forward to a, 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 a strong and fruitful relationship. I think there are incredible benefits to be um, to be seen uh, from this project and um, both in terms of, you know, construction jobs initially during this construction period, but then over the long term, um, you know, uh, the jobs actually at the terminal uh, for the installation and uh, staging and installation activities, uh, but then also the, uh, the other jobs that uh, will likely, um, uh, we will likely see in the area uh, in the supply chain, uh, in the supply chain and then uh, potentially uh, companies that are going to want to locate in New London um, to be a part of this uh, this new and growing industry. Should New London have a place on the Connecticut Port Authority board, John? Yeah. So back in January uh, 2019, actually before I started, um, we signed uh, the Port Authority signed an impact agreement with the city that, um, in part, was um, to uh, pay for um, uh, city services that uh, might be used at the pier. But also in that agreement, uh, we committed to supporting um, the mayor's uh, bid for a seat on the board in whatever uh, form that takes. Uh, there are a couple pieces of legislation for the Transportation Committee that, uh, that would seek to give the mayor a seat on the board, and we absolutely support that. Uh, Mayor Pastro, uh, in that uh, op-ed, you also talked about the loss of jobs handling cargo at the pier under this uh, this project, also harm to a uh, salt supplier who's been in business for some time. How will those issues be resolved? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, I think there's some damage that can be, that has been done that's, that is going to be, is not going to be repaired. Um, the salt um, the salt business, which was a great um, growing business here in New London, and it had its own supply chain, by the way, a uh, very healthy one. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, private industry and uh, municipalities around here depended on that business uh, for their road salt. Um, unfortunately, without really any collaboration or anything, they, that, that business was just dri driven out. Um, no, no pun intended, the name of the company was driven. Um, and, uh, you know, the loss of, of um, the longshoremen jobs, which um, historically have been very important to London, there were generations of people here that uh, worked at that port, including myself. When I was a college student, I used to what they called shape, shape up down there when a ship was in. Um, it was great, um, great money. Um, you know, most of that work is done by temporary um, uh, you know, they, they, what, the, what the union does is they give out temporary books so that they they have enough labor to un, unload a ship when a ship's in. Plus, there's some permanent full-time jobs there, to, you know, that work, um, you know, all, around the clock uh, to uh, to service the pier. But when a ship comes in, of course, you need, you know, 10, 20 times more labor all of a sudden while that ship is unloading. Um, and we've lost all that overnight um, without any collaboration with the city. Uh, which is really, really a shame. And it's been frustrating while all of this is going on and, and um, no representation from the city. And we've been locked out of all those decisions. Um, you know, there's one last issue down there. We have a couple of small family fishing companies uh, that have been down there for, for many years. Um, they're, they're still tied up there. And um, 
you know, we're all keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that, um, you know, the Connecticut Port Authority um, uh, make sure that they do not uh, damage those businesses. It's hard to find a place to relocate commercial fishermen. And, um, you know, our last, you know, our, our continuing difference with the Connecticut Port Authority is that they, they really have to um, ensure that these two fishing uh, businesses have a place to move before they, they drive them out of where they're tied up now. So, John Henshaw with the Port Authority, again, how do you address those particular concerns uh, with uh, small business and the longshoremen jobs when we're talking about this multi-million dollar redevelopment project of the state pier? Right. So um, just uh, on the fishermen first, uh, we're working uh, closely with the fishermen. I've been meeting with them uh, somewhat regularly uh, to uh, to uh, find a place for them to relocate to. And uh, we continue with those efforts. And uh, and I think we'll um, be successful uh, in that effort um, with respect to other jobs. Um, you know, the pier is going to be a construct- construction zone um, for the next two years. And so there was no way to accommodate businesses um, on the piers uh, during that time. And so, um, so, you know, we did make an effort to help uh, Driven uh, relocate. Uh, we were not successful in finding uh, another place for them to go that they that they felt was adequate. Um, and so they have uh, since moved. And um, and I. Um, I hope that they uh, they do find a place to relocate ultimately. You're hearing John Henshaw, the executive director of the Connecticut Port Authority, along with New London Mayor Michael Passero here on Where We Live. As we learn more about this uh, new uh, agreement uh, to move a multi-million dollar redevelopment project of the state pier in New London, you can join our conversation 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, certainly, John, uh, people in the New London community know about this project, but can you explain it to uh, listeners uh, elsewhere in our state about what the state of Connecticut will be getting out of renovation of of State Pier. Sure. So uh, we're going to be making generational improvements to this pier. It's it's in um, pretty rough shape. It's a dilapidated facility. Um, And I think that uh, the opportunity to use uh, both public and private funds to upgrade the the terminal is is a huge benefit to the state and to the city of New London. And, um, and, you know, for the lease period, uh, we're going to be handling uh, primarily um, wind turbine components, but um, but beyond that, um, we own the asset, uh, you know, into the future uh, after the lease period. So the the private monies that are invested there become uh, part of a, a public asset, and so I think that that's a that's a great potential benefit. The improvements that we're making are going to give um, additional uh, area for um, for freight to be stored, we call lay down area. Uh, it will uh, add uh, heavy lift capacity. We're going to be doing dredging, uh, two deep, um, two deep bursts, um, and so I think that um, you know there are great benefits to be realized out of this project. You can join our conversation again eight 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 seven two zero nine six seven seven. Kevin's calling in from Ledger. Kevin, you're on the show. All right. Thank you. Thank you for taking the call. I have a question for Mayor Passero. Uh, the Harbor Community Agreement only compensates New London if the project goes to full scope. Uh, having signed over your voice to Eversource and Orsted, uh, as is clearly laid out in the host community agreement, I'd like to ask if you are concerned uh, that if the project, the state peer project, moves to minimal scope, as laid out clearly in the harbor development agreement, uh, you know, as, as it can uh, move to minimal scope, that you'll be left without uh, you know, without your voice, without the ability to defend yourself, uh, and more importantly, your constituents. What the Port Authority is reporting about what we are going to get uh, is is going to change if the project goes to minimal scope. Uh, and I'll just say, I think Mayor Passero is playing a very tough hand uh, and, and doing the best he can. So I'll, I'll take uh, the answer uh, on or off the air, whatever you prefer. Uh, Mayor Passero, can you answer uh, Kevin's uh, questions? Yeah, I think there's a couple of misunderstandings um, and mistakes of fact underlying the question. First, um, neither I or the city signed over our voice. Um, as I said earlier, we have a very, and we have had a strong relationship with Orsted and Eversource. And we had a strong relationship with Deepwater Wind before Orsted bought out Deepwater Wind. 
I have longstanding relationships with all of the private parties involved in this project, um, and that will benefit the city of New London. Um, and I certainly did not sign over my voice, and they know that very well, but we do support this project. Um, um, so, um, you know, that you should not have any concerns as far as that go. And as far as our agreement with, um, with Orsted, the partnership with Orsted and, and Eversource, um, it does not depend on those contingencies you refer to that are in the Harbor Development um, Agreement. That's between uh, the state of Connecticut, the Connecticut Port Authority, and uh, the partnership of Orsted and Eversource. Mayor Pastor, so I, hope that, I hope that answers the question and, and puts those issues to rest. Kevin, when Kevin mentions minimal scope, uh, explain what he means by that. Does that mean less than seven or ten years uh, that this project will be in force? That doesn't. Uh, that does not come into play with the agreement that is strictly between the City of New London and Orsted Never Source. So you'll have to ask John Henshaw for that an explanation of that. John, That's, go ahead. That, that is contained in the Harbor Development Agreement between the CPA and uh, Orsted Never Source. John Henshaw, could you explain the minimum scope? Yeah, so um, the minimal scope uh, refers to uh, a situation where we cannot come to agreement with our partners in this project to build out the project. We are fully committed to uh, building this uh, project to its um, full realization. Um, it's you know that is that is where we're headed. That's that's where we're uh, what we have uh, funds allocated for. Um, and so our, our goal is to absolutely uh, build, um, build this project to its uh, full vision. I mentioned at the top of the show, this is a projected $157 million project, but the governor recently said it could top $200 million. So what is the current price of this redevelopment project, John Henshaw? So it's an evolving uh, thing, the, the cost of the project. As you might imagine, um, that $157 million number uh, was at 30% design. We have since gone on to 60% design and 90% design. And um, and each of those uh, evolutions has changed the price. Um, most recently, we brought on a construction manager. And uh, there's a difference between the way an engineer uh, looks at a project and the way somebody actually has to build it looks at a project. And so we are um, working with that uh, construction manager to um, to revise estimates uh, as to where uh, what the project's ultimately going to cost uh, through um, what we call value engineering. That's really just getting the most for your dollar uh, in the project, and also um, whatever um, minimal scope changes um, might need to be made to uh, to bring the uh, the project in at a cost that we can afford. So who pays for the increased price of the construction? So Eversource and Orsted, again, they're going to be paying, what, more than $77 million. Uh, but in terms of the state bonding for this increased uh, cost, I mean, is that problematic? Uh, you, what conversations have you had with the governor about the costs increasing, John? So I haven't had uh, any conversations with the governor uh, to date. But, um, but uh, so uh, the way the Harbor Development Agreement is written, is if um, there's a agreement on the 157 million dollars, if the costs go up, uh, we're uh, asked first to look at um, f identifying additional funds uh, to uh, see the project uh, completed. If we are unable to find those funds, then the um, then the partners uh, are are asked to look for uh, additional funding to uh, complete the project. And if neither of those things can happen, then we will uh, work with the funding we have available. Again, you're hearing John Henshaw, who's the executive director of the Connecticut Port Authority. He's new to the state, just hired uh, in this job uh, last fall, uh, was a, a former official with the Maine Port Authority. Uh, something related to what we've been talking about is just last week, the state attorney general saying he'll investigate the Connecticut Port Authority after lawmakers asked for a new review of the agency's contracts. Uh, the attorney general says his office is looking into a whistleblower complaint focused on a half million dollar success fee paid to see 
Seabury Capital as part of a settlement. There was a former Port Authority board member who was the managing director or is the managing director of Seabury Capital. And then the state hired Seabury to find a company to manage the port. The state contracting review board's also looking into the payment. John, I have to ask, is the Port Authority conducting any kind of internal review about this payment to Seabury Capital and the fact that a former board member works for this company? Yeah, so uh, obviously we, we've we looked um, very uh, thoroughly at the uh, the transactions and we haven't found anything um, wrong with them. Um, and, you know, we're obviously committed to cooperating fully and providing timely responses to any requests for information associated with this investigation. Just to be clear, this investigation started, I believe, in uh, 2019 um, and continues, apparently. Mm. You said that you don't see anything wrong with these payments. Can you describe what is a success fee? Sure. So they're um, pretty common in the in the port industry. These are incredibly valuable uh, public assets we're talking about. So in the case of uh, New London, the state pier there, we signed a concession with uh, Gateway Terminals, uh, which will uh, last for uh, 40 years. And so what we're looking to do is maximize our return on that concession uh, to the greatest extent we can. And that comes both in terms of uh, the lease costs uh, on the terminal, the revenue sharing, but importantly on capital investments. So um, so the success fee was based on uh, uh, planned capital investments uh, by Gateway and by their customers that they brought to the terminal or Stead and Eversource. And together those investments uh, are somewhere in the neighborhood of $80 million. Uh, you took on this job uh, after there have been several ethical issues with the Connecticut Port Authority. Uh, state auditors have found several p- problems in the financial affairs of the Port Authority in recent years. So what's being done to tighten financial controls? There's been a lot of discussion about uh, quasi-public agencies in our state, John, and the fact that these smaller structures often lack financial safeguards. Right. So I get, uh, back in uh, 2019, um, the Port Authority signed an MOU with the uh, Office of Policy and Management um, in the state uh, to provide financial oversight to the Port Authority. And so we work very closely with them. I meet regularly with them. I probably meet with OPM at least a couple times a week um, on uh, on financial oversight. We've revised our uh, policies and procedures. We've um, um, uh, put in place a new uh, financial um, uh, policies and procedures manual uh, that we follow. Um, I've hired a, um, a finance director for the authority, uh, we, just in the process of hiring a, a financial administrative assistant also. Um, so um, I think that we're in pretty good shape. That um, OPM and the Port Authority have worked hard over the last um, year uh, and more in putting a uh, 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 financial practices and procedures in place that will uh, will guide the authority, and I think, in a good way. Before we let you go, just to clarify for our listeners, when I mention uh, Seabury, tell us exactly what they did to secure the agreement. What work did they do for the state? So the initial work they did uh, had to do with um, putting together the RFP um, and and. Um, once and getting it out to uh, uh, potential uh, terminal operators and then uh, reviewing the responses that came back in um, w- uh, what was found and again i wasn't here but what was found at the time was these are very complex uh, financial proposals that came back and so they were able to assist with uh, with that um, and then um, the the final piece was um, you know finding um, both the terminal operator and other parties that were that were interested in, in investing in the facility. Does it concern you that well, you know, while we have this redevelopment project uh, moving forward, you have lawmakers in our state asking the Department of Transportation to draw up plans to eliminate the Port Authority? And again, these whistleblower compl- investigation and complaints that the State Attorney General is looking into, John Henshaw. Yeah, so. Um, as I um, indicated earlier, those whistleblower contains complaints were from 2019, I believe. Um, and so, um, you know, those investigations will continue. And I, I think rightfully so. 
Um, so, um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of your question? Well, I'm just wondering, you, you've taken on a, a, quite an interesting job at the time when there are lots of ethical questions right. about uh, this quasi-public. And again, this investigation into uh, the agency by the state attorney general, I'm just wondering how you plan to, to move forward when there's a lot of scrutiny about this quasi-public. Well, I'm certainly not um, afraid of scrutiny. I think scrutiny is a good thing. Um, just with respect to the uh, the need or, or usefulness of, of a port authority, I mean, port authorities um, deal with a unique environment. Um, marine construction uh, and maintenance, dredging, uh, those kinds of activities are unique to this industry. And I think it's important to have somebody that's um, uh, narrowly focused on, on uh, those kinds of um, uh, activities. And... Um, while at the same time, you know, realizing the economic benefits that can be um, can be had from our uh, maritime transportation assets. Well, we hope to revisit this uh, again. John Henshaw is the executive director of the Connecticut Port Authority. Thank you for coming on today, John. Thank you. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. There's a lot more going on in the city of New London. We'll talk about it with Mayor Michael Passero right after the break. Do you live or work in New London? Do you have a question or comment related to the State Pier Project or another issue? You can join us too, 888-720-9677. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. My guest today is Michael Passero. He's serving in his second term as mayor of the city of New London. Before he was first elected mayor in 2015, he was a firefighter. And I understand, Mayor, your first job in New London was a lifeguard way back when. Yeah, that was, um, I, I think it's a tradition that a lot of uh, young people in New London uh, circulate through uh, working down at um, Ocean Beach Park. And I think, uh, uh, people from all over the state, uh, if there's one thing they know about New London, they probably know Ocean Beach Park because it's uh, probably the the most beautiful beach waterfront that, that there is in the state, if not New England. And uh, like and they provide, the beach provides um, employment to our youth uh, every summer, uh, great summer jobs, no matter what role you have there. But, you know, as a former lifeguard, I can say that being a, life, a lifeguard at Ocean Beach Park is... Uh, it's a it's a, it's a great honor and uh, and and position for 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 our young people. Mm. Uh, speaking of, of the beach, uh, Michael called in earlier and wanted to know how uh, you, as mayor, are taking into consideration climate change and sea level rise as you plan for major developments on the shore, and wants to know how you'll take into consideration local perspectives beyond commercial stakeholders. How do you answer that? Well, um, we have a sustainability committee, which is very active and doing great work, and they have achieved their a bronze certification with uh, the Sustainable CT initiative out of DEP. We've also worked with the, a design collaborative up at the University of Connecticut with uh, Peter Minuti, and we have designed one of our areas that is vulnerable is the area behind um, east of Bank Street, um, it's a, uh, it's an air, it's the street's name. The back street is uh, South Water Street. It runs along the train tracks. That is one of the few areas in our town that is threatened by sea level rise. And uh, we, we, are, we have the design plans complete on how to um, uh, make that area resilient. Um, the other area, of course, uh, which is um, threatened is Fort Trumbull. There's been a great deal of investment down there. And as we move forward, uh, we are respecting the uh, floodplain certifications uh, that that are on that land. So um, that's going to be all new development. Um, and we will develop that uh, with an understanding of what um, climate change uh, holds for the future. Fortunately, the rest of New London, the banks of the river are very steep. Um, and after an analysis essentially by this group out of Yukon, uh, we don't have to worry about sea level rise in a great deal of, uh, of you know, most of our most of our city. 
I'm glad you brought up Fort Trumbull. I understand last month the city council approving a $30 million community center in this area. The area was an issue in the Kilo v. New London U.S. Supreme Court case more than 15 years ago. Uh, the high court ruled the New London Development Corporation could seize homes in Fort Trumbull for a construction project that included Pfizer. As we know, that project was never built. So describe that area and how much of a difference this community center will make, Mayor. Well, we're very excited that this um, this investment by the city uh, will finally put that pretty sad chapter of New London's history um, to rest. Uh, You're going back 20 years. And by the way, uh, Pfizer's global research building um, complex was built. Um, It is it's a it's a it's a beautiful campus, Um, three buildings, um, parking structure. and, and well designed, and it is um, it's currently occupied by General Dynamics Electric Boat. It's where these um, the, our submarine fleet is being designed. Um, so it it's doing uh, a great job uh, driving our local economy here. As you probably know, Electric Boat has at least now like it's hard to keep track, but I think they're up to about $40 billion um, worth of government contracts in the pipeline. We're looking at 20 years of security um, for the local economy, just with that one employer. And, um, you know, they're in New London, they're attracting uh, talent, um, skilled um, skilled jobs and, and technical jobs and engineers. Um, and it's, it's just terrific that and with the plant across the river. So, um, you know, where the success of, of EB um, is also driving the success of New London, and we believe that's going to translate to the peninsula. But we um, we had the land available, and the, the people in New London have been um, dreaming of, of building a rec, community rec center for decades now. Fortunately, the city's um, success over the last five or six years um, growing our grand list, uh, improving our fund balance. Um, a lot of the financial indicators have put us in a position to be able to invest in ourselves. And this is a great investment that we're making in ourselves. And we think that it's a very appropriate use of this land and respects the sacrifice that was made uh, by, the, by the people 20 years ago who had their properties taken. Uh, when you before you were uh, reelected, uh, you had said the single most pressing issue facing your city was the need for development of the downtown and empty lots. That was before the pandemic. So, how has the pandemic impacted your downtown, including uh, more housing, Mayor? Um, well, we are very excited that the um, a vacant lot right in the heart of our downtown. It's referred to locally as Partial J. It's been vacant since the Model Cities program back in the 60s. Um, It um, construction began approximately two years ago before the pandemic. The building uh, will be finished this spring. It's 137 units. And uh, we believe this is going to be a catalyst um, for um, bringing more foot traffic. Um, You know, New London's always been sort of a destination to, to drive into for dinner and for shows. Um, The economy's driven by our arts and culture uh, uh, industry here, um, the Guard Arts Center, uh, one of the six major performing arts centers uh, in the state. Um, so New London's always had um, that, um, you know, that great economic driver, but uh, w- w- our goal is to have more people living in this great urban center. Um, and so we're building the housing uh, to provide that opportunity. Um, and uh, the developers um, obviously see the, um, the market for that. So this first building with 137 units is, is going to be leasing up in the spring. A second building um, less than 100 yards from that down Howard Street towards the, the Fort Trumbull Peninsula will break ground in the spring. And we have a third project um, uh, further north in the downtown area near the, near the fire headquarters um, that just recently received its site plan approval. So we're hoping we're moving very closely to getting another 200 units built there. So if you add all that up, uh, the face of our downtown will be changing over the course of the next uh, two two or three years. And the population of our, of our immediate downtown area, this great um, you know, um, urban center with an intermodal transportation center will, um, will re- be remarkably transformed. 
There I want to fit in. Oh, Mayor, I want to fit in a quick call from a listener. Uh, Michelle had a question for you. Michelle, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, yes. Um, good morning, Mayor. Um, my Michelle name is Michelle Fairley. I'm the wife of Steve Fairley from Driven. I know you spoke with him before a couple years ago. Uh, you had let us know that you were in all favor of keeping it a dual port and having my husband stay, not leave not have the shoremen or the fishermen leave. I believe you still have not found a place for the fishermen, though I don't think you spoke to them recently. Um, why all the change? Why do you feel that it's a better thing to have only one company run the port in the state? Because um, to me, obviously, to everyone I talk to, that isn't a good idea. Oh. Mayor Passero? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. It's a good question. I, first of all, um, I, I have not changed my position. Um, I And as I said earlier in the show, I'm not sure if you were listening. Um, I was a strong supporter of um, of keeping the port as a um, multi-use port. Um, as you know, uh, Congressman Courtney had secured grants to improve the rail line that goes into this port. Uh, we had that thriving, thanks to your husband's business driven, we had that thriving salt business um, and, and, and really the previous operator was um, doing a great job bringing in the break bulk cargo and that was providing jobs to the city. You know, unfortunately the city of New London, as I said, was not at the table when all of these decisions were made. And um, I did spend time trying to lobby and work with, um, you know, all the parties to keep driven there. But ultimately the city's voice was not considered and not heard. And that's a different issue from the relationship that we were developing early on with deep water wind um, to have our harbor host uh, at least a role in the uh, build out of the offshore wind industry. Um, and, um, and we were well along in those plans. Those plans with deep water wind did not involve um, this exclusive use um, arrangement that the Port Authority and the state have made with Orstad Neversource. That said, um, we, you know, I'm acting in the best interest of the city and the current project um, as it's laid out um, right now, moving forward, uh, we support it 100% and are, are willing to work for it. Unfortunately, I, I cannot change, um, as I said earlier, I can't fix uh, those mistakes that were made without the involvement of the city early on. Uh, Mayor Michael Passero, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an interesting hour. We'll definitely check in again to see how uh, this peer project uh, moves forward, and we hope to talk with you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been it's been a joy. Thank you, and come back to the city soon. Oh, definitely. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to talk to the Day of New London columnist, David Collins. He covers the city and the Connecticut Port Authority. We'll get more context for him. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Joining us now on Zoom, David Collins. He's a columnist for The Day in New London. David, welcome back. Good morning, Lucy. Thanks for having me. There's a lot to unpack. You've been covering uh, this uh, this develop redevelopment project uh, for some time, as well as the Connecticut Port Authority. Why do you think this agreement was reached now? Um, well, it's really clear there was a deadline coming up. The DEP is about to consider the um, the really massive permits that are going to be need, needed for the uh, environmental impact of this project. They're going to take a whole sort of mountainside, if you will, of the pier area and put it in between the two piers to make a bigger laydown area for the wind company. So it's seven acres of, of the harbor that they're going to fill in. So that's a big ask of the DEP. And the mayor had said, because he wasn't being cut into the deal and there was no remuneration for the city, but he was going to basically oppose it in that hearing. So the hearing is about to start and they finally they finally came to the table and gave the city some remuneration, which um, clearly the mayor had kind of a gun to their head and, and they acted on. On Monday, Governor Lamont was asked if he still supports the state pier expansion project. If the price tag continues to grow. I think it's again $200 million or more. This is what he said. Uh, yes is the answer to that question. I think it's uh, good news. We're trying to finalize the cost of the pier. 
It's a pier that's going to be uh, utilized by Orsted and uh, necessary to get the wind power going over the next 10 years, at which point uh, New London will have its own modern state pier able to support a lot of other functions as well. So I think it's a good investment for uh, the state and a good investment for New London. So, David, walk us through uh, your take on this and as the price continues to grow and what needs to happen uh, when that does happen. You know, it's interesting that he, he said that because uh, he brought it up a couple of weeks ago at the editorial board meeting of the day. And, and he just kind of threw out offhandedly that the price had gone from the original, well, actually, there was at $93 million, and then it went up to 157 when they signed the deal. And they said when they signed the deal, it would never go more than 157. And the state was on the hook for whatever it goes over that. They promised, no, no, we really looked at this and researched it, and that's the most it could ever be. And then just casually, the government <laughs> mentions that, oh, yes, it's going to be another 40 million, and we're not done. And we're not really clear. I think they've finished designing 90% of it, so it could go up even more than that. So it's an enormous amount of money. And I, I guess this, the, it was curious the governor said this week he's willing to commit it. That's another. Um, another 40 million on top of the uh, 157 um, and, and who knows, maybe on top of that. So it's kind of a puzzle why the, the governor is so committed to this project. I mean, um, there's no real studies that I know of that show um, the, the benefits of it. Um, the number of jobs is pretty insignificant, really. It's, it's, it's um, the number of people you might get with a new Walmart and um, um, the assembly is all going to, the manufacturer is all going to occur in Europe. And they're going to bring these big pieces in and assemble them on the pier and then take them back out and install them offshore. So there's very little impact. It doesn't seem like economic impact. There's no more manufacturing jobs, no sort of um, ripple effect from all this investment. So it's a lot of money. Maybe it's worth it. I, you know, they, they seem really committed to pushing on despite all the... <laughs> allegations and corruption and the problems with the Port Authority. I mean, the governor seems definitely um, ready to just keep pushing, shoveling money into it. Well, what about the impact when we think about uh, wind energy, uh, David? Do you think that's part of why uh, the governor wants to see this through? Sure. And, and, you know, that, I don't mean to diminish that as, a, as, a, as an important goal. And the state has has committed to that. They've, they've, um, they've uh, put these contracts uh, out to bid and, and uh, organized um, um, a whole series of, of um, um, uh, buys for this offshore wind in which all of us, we don't even know how much, but we're all going to pay more for the electricity that the state is organizing to come from these offshore wind farms. What's not clear to me, and I don't think it's been studied, is why the state then also has to help to, to the tune of a hundred million dollars or more, um, why they also have to help build the the plant, if you will, that's going to help make this offshore wind happen. I mean, the companies are already being compensated. Um, there are other offshore wind assembly places, um, the ports that have developed up and down the East Coast. It's not necessarily clear that they need New London. Um, and I'm not sure what the benefits are, especially to the state of Connecticut. And I, I'd be curious to see them lay those out if they have a study to show why that's going to be so beneficial to New London that it would have to pay $100 million to contribute to the, to the industry's um, um, commitment to, to, to building these offshore funds, farms. I, I'd be curious to see it. I, they've never produced that. Could you explain to our listeners again uh, this latest, uh, these ethical questions uh, related to the contract to Seabury? Again, uh, John Henshaw kind of dismissed uh, that and said that nothing was done inappropriately. I guess there should be no surprise that he would say that. But if you could describe again to our listeners uh, why this raises questions, not only from state lawmakers, but the state contracting standards board. Yes, you know, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually old enough that I, I, I'm doing pretty well in, in Governor Lamont's age bracketed vaccine rollout. I actually have an appointment scheduled. Um, and I'm also old enough that I remember the movie uh, Poltergeist, and maybe some of your older listeners remember that too. But in the movie, all of the haunting and the terrible um, uh, things that happen <clears throat> in this development that's built, it's because in the end we find out the developer didn't move the graves. He built on top of a cemetery and he didn't move the bodies, he only moved the headstones. And I feel like that's a good analogy for what's happened here. They, they chose this company that basically ultimately chose the operator of the port. It sort of laid the groundwork for what's happening. Um, and it was chosen It was chosen for the wrong reasons. It was, it was given to a company, turns out the the 
managing director of the company, was a board member of the Connecticut Port Authority very soon before the contract was signed. <clears throat> and the contract gave the, the company an incentive to find certain um, operators that were going to invest more money and pay them more money. And so they weren't looking at what was the best thing for the state of Connecticut. They were looking at what was the best thing for them. And it turned out what happened was that they gave the control of the Port of New London to the Port of New Haven. Of course, it's like giving Burger King to McDonald's. And <laughs> as soon as McDonald's had Burger King, they shut it down. They, you know, they, they, they're bringing all the cargo now that was going into, not all, but a lot of the cargo that was going into New London, into New Haven. They're unloading it with non-union labor. And they're not paying the state any fees. So who doesn't like, who wouldn't like that? And there was another bidder that, that this company um, that's now under investigation, there was another bidder that had run the port for many years that had increased the cargo traffic. And they said, we can do both. We can do wind assembly and we can do traditional cargo. But the Port Authority, which at the time was, we now know extremely corruptly run, chose this other operator. I do remember Poltergeist, uh, David. <laughs> I'm not that young. Uh, but mo uh, moving along, yeah. <laughs> uh, before we run out of time, uh, so where do things stand? So again, the Attorney General uh, has been investigating. Lawmakers are, um, are not happy with this quasi-public. I mean, what will you be watching for in the next few months? Um, you know, I think the legislators are, are, are waking up a little bit to all of this. And, and we had um, Republican legislators writing to the Attorney General and sort of basically demanding some answers here. Um, the Attorney General clearly has not pushed this investigation to a front burner. Maybe that'll change if there's more political pressure. Democrats are looking at actually taking the whole Port Authority back and putting it back in the Department of Transportation, which it seems to me would be a long go a long way towards sort of resolving some of the things it would sort of it would it would do more than just put the headstones back i think it would sort of restore a little bit of the of the order if if the port were restored to its 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 um uh, traditional use of, for cargo and, and could also accommodate um this um, uh, offshore wind development so i'm looking at those things i'm, I'm looking at see really and there's also one more, they, they can't confirm that they're investigating, but there certainly have been indications from the Office of Ethics that they're looking at that contract too. And this was a contract, the, the, the success fee contract. And it's sort of the underlying underpinning of everything that's happened and even really happening at the port. So I would look at that, I'd look to that to see what happens with that and to see how serious the lawmakers get about cleaning up not only this problem, but the problems of the quasis in general. And this is just another example of David Collins, again, is a columnist for The Day in New London. Uh, he and his colleagues have done some really great uh, reporting uh, into the Connecticut Port Authority, as well as following the State Pier Project. Uh, we'd love to have you back, David. We thank you for your time today. Great. Thanks for having us. Uh, this is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show is produced by Matt Dwyer. Thanks to Carmen Baskoff on the phones. Coming up tomorrow, uh, Connecticut teachers have started to get appointments for the COVID-19 vaccine. We're going to check back in with three local teachers. Before the pandemic, educators have been stretched thin. What has this last year been like for them and their students? We're going to have a very honest conversation with them. That conversation tomorrow. We hope you stay with us.